Um, well, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a real great opportunity here that we're going to be hearing from uh, Mr. Michael Freilich, who is, has been really a mainstay of, of Seaboard for many years. Uh, in case anybody doesn't know me, I'm Bob Watts, president of the Seaboard region. And uh, Michael uh, how, has done so many things for the region. How can I mention him? He was our Masim Tovim honoree in 2015. Uh, and he's had a long history of service to the FJMC and to the Seaboard re region in leading us and training us uh, to be better leaders and programming. He was, uh, he's been a regional vice president, brotherhood president, and now he's an advisor to the Seaboard region. And uh, he's uh, done regional seminars and uh, uh, spoken at the international conventions. His, his session on uh, the exodus at the Toronto convention was standing room only. So uh, you have something to look forward to. Michael is an attorney uh, in Baltimore. He received his undergrad degree from Columbia and also studied at the JTS while there. He has a PhD in philosophy from Ohio State and his JD from Case Western. And uh, he's, as I said, he practices law in Baltimore. Uh, and he and uh, his wife, Barbara, have uh, been married about 53 years and have two children, David and Honey, and four grandchildren. And so Michael's been an uh, active member also of the International Kiddish Club and uh, really been an inspiring ment mentor, teacher, and friend to all of us uh, in the region. And so with this depth of knowledge of prayer and Jewish history, I never missed the opportunity to hear him speak and to get him to speak. He was supposed to lead a session at our regional retreat. So I asked him to appear here as part of our efforts to bring you virtually what we had hoped to hear in person. So Michael? Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I tend to speak quickly. You may want to take some notes as I go. If you have any questions, I can be interrupted. I just reserve the right one. I'm going to respond to them at all or at that moment. All right, let's begin. In the ancient tradition of the uh, Greeks, there were different types of students. We find that in uh, Plato's uh, Republic. We find it in Aristotle's teachings that you talk to people at their level and you try to train them. I'm going to try to talk to all four levels of the four sons which is the way we handle it in Judaism from the Haggadah. All right. Where does our history begin? Where do we start praying? Who knows? Was there an exodus? I don't think so. A lot of modern scholars do not believe there was an exodus as such. However, it's been dated between 1220 uh, and a little bit before. Now, notice that you had the Santorini eruption, which is a whole island that disappeared in the Mediterranean basin uh, just off the coast of Sicily and Greece. And that laid a uh, tribute to the 10 plagues and they take natural wonders, and they put it together. There's a book by Theodore Gaster on myth in the ancient Near East where he talks about this, but it's where we get a lot of our sources from. Right, let's jump ahead to, from the supposedly the desert uh, and the wilderness to David. What was the primary form of worship? Well, we think there were a few Psalms, and we think that when we know there was animal worship, animal sacrifice, or what they called the sacrificial cult, that dominated our form of, of worship for many times. Well, all right, let's go on. What do we have after that? We have Solomon who built the temple. What did he do? This is roughly around the time of Homer, and what he did was, again, sacrifice. They didn't necessarily have books. Then in 930, you have the split with Solomon's sons, into Judea and, and, and uh, uh, the northern tribes. What's important here is that guys who got in the leftovers and who developed was the beginning of the development of the Levites as a separate unit. What was their worship? What did they do? It's not clear because it wasn't until 722 when the 10 tribes were described that they ended up, Assyria destroyed Israel, that they ended up sending these guys to the south who were the teachers and the educators. 
We don't know many of them by name, but they send to work pretty hard. What was the religion at that time? If you take a look at the uh, uh, Haftorot and the, the scroll, Deuteronomy, you have Josiah, who was the king in roughly 620. He's ruled for about 30 years. I view him as the super king of Israel. Uh, there was a fight between Babylonia and Egypt. He went between the two, and he was able to maintain his kingdom for many, many years. He has a guy who was his high priest who found a scroll in the temple, which he called the, uh, uh, the, the scroll, and that ultimately was the source of our Torah. And he, if, if you think back to when we have the Haftorah on uh, basically uh, men's club weekend, we see the same one appears every year. They talk about how the priests were taking the money and not spending it for the improvements of the temple. And he's the guy who straightened out. He brought religion back. He's probably the guy who, in addition to the three Masech Tot that we find in Devorim, putting the rest of the Torah together. Well, after, after his reign was over, Nebuchadnezzar comes in and roughly 597 just surrounds Jerusalem for the first time and destroys a chunk of it. Then he gets into a big ass fight with Egypt. And in order to handle that, he leaves Jerusalem to its own accord and he disappears. Where does he go? He goes, he fights Egypt. And in Egypt, the Jews decided, decided with, with uh, Egypt and they thought that Egypt would come and rescue the Jews from Babylonians, but it didn't work out. And so we got the long side of that and the temple was destroyed in 587 or 586. What was, what was the temple, what was the worship like then? We think there were some Psalms, we know there was animal sacrifice and that's pretty much what happened. We know what went on with that, what, 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 what went down. Then roughly in 540, Cyrus II says, okay guys, I'm sending you back, the Persians are here, go establish your own religion, go do your thing, and he sends them back lots of tax money. There's a question whether that was in the 540 or the 440s, we're not sure. And the same thing with Ezra and Nehemiah. But we do know that they established reading of a scroll, which is when they first produced the, 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 the Torah. And we believe it was produced between 587 and 540, in what was then part of Persia or part of Babylonia. Okay, so what did they do? Ezra established reading of the Torah as part of the service. Well, what else did Ezra do? He also established, probably saying the Shema, but we're not sure, and one or two prayers that went around it. Ezra is also responsible for, for uh, helping establish the Second Temple, which was roughly in 516 it was dedicated. Around this time, Ezra and a couple of the other boys became what's called Anche Chesed Hagadola, the 120 Jewish leaders, which included some of the Levites who were the guys who fled from the Assyrians split in a part of 722. And they developed, if you will, a prayer, a set of prayers. The set of prayers they developed was the Shema and one or two of the prayers around it, and what became called in the Talmud Tefillah, Tefillah just meant prayer. It also meant the uh, Amidah, the standing benediction, the 18 blessings. There's been changes to the content of these, but how did they pray them? What did they do? Well, we don't know. We think that they did the first verses and the last verses, because it went on for almost 700 years before it got written down in good form. It was written down in good form Hi, Barb. My wife just walked in. So if you see her, you know who she's here. You I'm not his wife. I'm his girlfriend. Both. All right, so, okay, I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm all right. So what happened was they had this, the fila, these 18 benedictions. And they were developing, and the cantors or the rabbis or the guys who led services would write them down on a scroll, because that's how it's, things were written down those days. They were written down on parchment in scroll form. Around 200, they developed uh, books with pages or leaves, and they put a road through them, and they were a rope through them, and they were called codex. So that's how they ended up with book form, and they passed them down from person to person. Right. But we left something out. During the time of the men of the Great Assembly, you have a couple of things happening. You have the Hellenization of Palestine and Judea. You have Plato, you have Aristotle, you have Alexander. 
Alexander is the classic. In 332, he uh, conquered the entire Mediterranean uh, basin. He also brought Greek and Greek history to Judea. Now, all the, the, the Jews in that time who were knowledgeable, sorry, who were leaders in the community spoke Greek. That was their first language. Hebrew was the second language. There's one scholar uh, who estimated that only 15 to 20% of the Jews during this time in uh, Israel spoke Hebrew. That was all. So they, felt, they picked up a lot of the Greek thought. A little later, when we're going to go to the evening service, I'm going to show you the Greek influence of the fight between Plato and Aristotle and how it plays out in, in our history. Then we go on a little bit and we have the Maccabees. During the Maccabees, Antiochus said, you can no longer read Torah and you can't teach Torah. So what did the Jews do? They taught and read the Psalms. That's how we introduced the Haftarah and the Haftarot were read and that's when we introduced the Haftarah in our service. All right, then we jump ahead. 70 CE, the temple's destroyed. But who's living around that time? Rabban Gamliel II. Gamliel II was a Nasi. He was the grandfather of Judah Hanasi. Heavy duty, heavy duty thinker. And this is also when they're formalizing, not for, uh, when they're formulating much of what goes into the Torah. And Rabban Gamliel is very upset because there was no such thing as a set form for the prayers. So he wrote in uh, part of uh, part of Masechet Shabbat and part of several other of the, of the Masechet in the Talmud, what should be in the prayers and what should be the tefillah, where the 18 benedictions are the standing prayer. That's where a lot of that was formulated, right? What happens? He's a young man. And then you have the Bar Kokhba revolution and you have the, and we got whacked again. Okay, let's go, let's, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, you have Akiva, Bar Kokhba, and several of these fellows all lived around the same time. They were developing prayer as we know it. And they would develop these codexes or these bound books that each cantor or each Baal Tefillah master prayer kept, which had the prayers in it for the Tefillah and for the Shema. What's interesting is the central paragraphs were uh, basically do what you want, follow a basic script, but it really wasn't what everybody would do. So you could have them close to part close, uh, a shul next to one, a shul next to another, a small congregation, and the contents of the prayers would be slightly different, but the beginnings and the endings would be, be pretty much the same. Robin Gamliel put it together. You know the prayer at the end of the Amidah, or it's actually not part of the Amidah, it's the 19th prayer. Let my tongue uh, speak no evil. That was an added on prayer by Rabbi uh, Rav Bar Rava in roughly the second century. And what happened was people would prefer to make their own prayers, but then they were worried people couldn't say their own prayers and there was a problem with the Hebrew language because people spoke Greek. So what they did was they picked up this language and they made it their own. And they would develop these different prayers that did different things. By the way, does anybody know what the word tefillah means? Or the root fella? It means to, uh, in classical Hebrew it means self-assess. And if you look at the, the uh, Amidah, a lot of the prayers are being self-assessing. So Rabbi uh, Rav Amon put this last prayer in because he wanted people to be comfortable praying their own prayers and what they went on. Then they were no longer capable of doing it. So Kamiel uh, said to four of his students, write prayers that are solo just for yourselves. And that's what they did. And that prayer uh, at the end of the 19th benediction is not part of the Amidah. And what that is, is the only time in our entire liturgy where we say, forgive me for what I have done and not for what we have done. It's the only personal prayer in our entire liturgy. Okay. Then you go on and you have the academies in Babylonia that are getting established around roughly 200 of the common era. And you have the Talmud being put together. You have the development of the Jerusalem Talmud, development of the Babylonian Talmud. And then you have Muhammad was born in roughly uh, 571. And you have these various influences coming in as to what should constitute prayer 
How does it get developed? Let's go back one step. We talked about the codex where they had leaves put together where they were sealed at the end with like a string. All right. By the way, that's the type of codex that was found in the uh, Geniza in Cairo by Schechter. Uh, they tend to pick, they, if, if, I'd like to go back to the period of Raman Gamaliel. If you go to the Talmud, they have various discussions of why should we do Hebrew if everybody's not comfortable in Hebrew if you don't understand the prayers. And they go back and forth, and it depends who you, who you want to follow, what you end up with in the list of what's the appropriate prayer. All right. Then, when were these, how did these commentaries come about? Well, imagine these books with the prayers that were written in Hebrew. Right. Well, they had them on sheets of of uh, not papyrus of uh, vellum and things like that, made out of skins. They were thick. Well, you didn't go out and publish a book. If you had something to say, you wrote it in the margins. So, if you remember what our page of the Talmud looks like, this is how they ended up developing it from uh, roughly the first century CE onward was they put their notes in the columns to, with, with their instructions and what they do and how to read it in their commentaries. Okay. So then you go ahead and you have two different traditions are born. I'd like to jump ahead to the six or seven hundreds. Remember we had various Torahs running around. Nobody knew what the scroll was supposed to be. So what, what happened was a group of rabbis got together and families of rabbis they were called the Masoretes, and they fixed the text of the Torah. They also, along the way, started to fix the text of the uh, Sidor. So now you, you back up. You have the Sidor starts its, uh, its origins around the Bar Kokhba period with uh, 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 Robin Gamliel formalizing it. But it's not really put together yet. The first major change you have in the first, quote, Sidor that we have that was relatively well acknowledged, acknowledged was by Sadia Gaon. Sadia, as you know, was a, a, a famous rabbi in the ancient uh, Sir, uh, Arab lands who wrote extensively and put together what was considered an I guess, almost a primogeniture of what we call today the Sidur. That was then worked on and made a little bit stronger by a guy called Amram Gaon, who was also a famous rabbi and his version took off. Rashi, I don't remember if he did a, a, a Sidor or not, I knew, I forgot. Maimonides made a great contribution to what should have been the Sidor. Okay, now, when you go on, we complement each other, and we have the development of Gutenberg with the press, and then it's the printing press in roughly the 1400s. Well, he has movable type. There were two schools of printing in, in the Jewish world. Sancino in Italy in the 1400s. In the same period, there was the, the Galatia family called Bloomberg who did the Talmud in Germany. They had big fights. And one of the big, you know, because it was a lucrative business. And one of the big fights it led to was the Pope getting involved. And the Pope said, the only official volume that we have of Jewish text is Blumberg. And Blumberg will then be responsible for publishing this, and they burned a lot of the other books, especially the Talmud of the Sanchino family in public places. So there's a big fight about that uh, in history where a lot of our books were burned. Then you jump ahead to the 1500s, and you have the Shulchan Aruch with certain rules to put together how we pray, how we daven, and that was done in Safad. It's interesting that uh, such a guy who was so strict on rules as, as uh, 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 Caro was also a buddy of the guys who did the Hadodi and the Shabbat song in bringing mysticism into Judaism. We get down a little further. Okay. Then in the middle of the 1800s, you have the beginning of the awakening of the scientific revolution in Judaism. And you have uh, Zaharia Frankel, who's considered to be the father of the conservative movement, Abraham Geiger is being considered to be the father of the reform movement. And you have one other person who is a, considered to be the father of modern orthodoxy. And they took different views on what the center should be and they took ways of expressing things. 
Now, let's go back to the 330 BCE. That's a critical period. That's when Alexander introduced the Palestine and Jerusalem and Israel to Greek culture. Greek culture has had a tremendous influence on our religion. Most of our early rabbis knew Greek culture. They almost all knew Aristotle's uh, uh, called a book that's been translated called Rhetoric. Much of the argument forms in the Talmud come directly from Aristotle. Now, after Aristotle, they established colleges in the ancient Near East to teach Arist Aristotelian rhetoric and the uh, Greek classics. And one of the major institutions was in northern Turkey, I'm sorry, in southern Turkey. Uh, I just lost the name of the guy who did it, but he begins with a P. Uh, I just forgot who he was. Anyhow, what he talked about was how you make argument forms and what you do and how you become an educated person by arguing. All right. Now, let, I'd like to take one other look if we can. We have a little time left. I want to go to the uh, seat door, Bob. Can you open up the seat door? Can you make it a little bigger? Okay, this is the first prayer after the Shema. Okay. All right, I'm gonna translate it my way because I think it's more, it'll, it'll be, more accurate, but not necessarily flowery. And I want to show you the Greek influence on our th religious thought. Praise be your Lord, guiding of the world, who by his word brings on evening. Okay, he talks and it happens. Bahma poteh, with wisdom, he opens the skies and he changes the times and he flips the seasons. And he and he orders a car, the, the stars, Hakokafim, from Ishmaelotehem, according to their uh, places in the Perkia Birtano, in the firma which he created. He creates day and night and Lila. All right. Now, what is going on here? Do you know? God's creating time. What do you mean, God's creating time? Go back to your early Greek philosophy. You have the uh, prima mobile, the first prime mover. Who's the first prime mover? Well, we claim it's God. And for Plato, God, time was created by the prime mover. For Aristotle, time always was. Time, so you have the basic clash between the non-religious or having something more powerful than God and God. And that's what you have going on here. And then it says, the Lord of hosts is his name. You know what the Lord of hosts was? That's the celestial bodies. And this is the prima mobile, it's Greek philosophy dead on. Okay, next. Go back to Plato and you have a book called the Phaedo. It's from the middle period of Plato at the same time, roughly as the Republic. And in there, uh, he talks about pure knowledge, and, and Aristotle, uh, Plato talks about having pure knowledge when you're to live, when you no longer have bodily form or experiences to shape your thought. You go back to pure thinking of ideas one against the other. These are Plato's forms. It's his epistemological theory, his thinking theory, right? And we have the idea of shadows in the Republic against the cave, against the wall. If all you saw was shadows, that would be your reality. It's Aristotle and Plato fighting. You have this here. You have that in much of what we do. And in the Phaedo, you have a mistranslation by the Jews. And we end up with, in the Hebrew thought, of Tachaye uh, HaMetim, a resurrection of the dead, not understanding fully what Plato was doing, and misconstruing a little bit of Aristotle. But this is where a lot of our stuff goes back to in our prayers. You have to unravel them layer by layer. By the same token, you can look at this and think as God being the most powerful 
on understanding the Greek and the Roman influence. That's one of the few beauties of our prayer, which ties us back to the four different ways of learning that we talk about in Judaism with the four sons. Okay, I've given you an awful lot of stuff in about a half hour to 30 minutes. Any questions that you want me to deal with at this time? Or did I really lose your... I have to ask people to unmute themselves if they have a question. Mike, Michael, I, I did have a question about, um, did I understand you correctly when you said that the, the Torah fully came together around 600 to 900? Yes, there were different, ver it was, it's about a thousand years from the time Josiah in roughly 622 or so, uh, his high priest found the scroll for the three Masechta in Devorim. They then took campfire stories that had really been ingrained in the people, and they put those together into Torah and came with a scroll. They modified it, they changed it, they reacted to it. They came out with the official uh, words and punctuation and trope in the six to nine hundreds by the group of guys called the Masoretes. Did I answer your question? It, it, it does. I guess I, I guess I, I guess it, surpri it surprises me. I, I guess it confuses me somewhat that um, uh, some somehow or other, both the Christian religion and the Jewish religion take the Old Testament as their well. Obviously, the Jewish religion takes the Old Testament as their, but so does the Christian religion. But it seems as though it seems as though the Old Testament wasn't there when at the time of Jesus. I guess it I'm was a there. Confused. It was there. It was there about six hundred, about four hundred years before Jesus. But it was a rudimentary form. There were different uh, stories, and it didn't make. I'm sorry. It didn't have a fixed canon, a fixed text. Now, when uh, Mark, I believe the confusion is that when Michael was talking about 600, he meant 600 BCE, not 600 CE, right, Michael? Right. The Masoretes were 600 of the Common Era, and uh, the Josiah was 600 BCE before the Common Era. A thousand year difference. Okay, but we're we're. Well, were you, were you saying though that the Torah took full shape at, at 600, 600 AD to 900 AD, or, or did I get that wrong? Is that is that the finalization of the words and the trope was between 600 and 900, working off of various script manuscripts that they had. Okay, but but uh, okay, but but, but the original really the original the original. The way we, the rudimentary form of the Torah was pretty much established during the Babylonian exile, roughly 586 to 540 BCE. Okay. Now, a lot of this is new scholarship that had, when in the 60s, this scholarship didn't exist. The 1960s. This is new scholarship stuff. Hal? Michael, you, you, you said that uh, in the time of the Greeks, uh, 400s and 300s of BCE, most people, most of the Jews were at the time were talking, were speaking in, uh, in Greek. Yep. Can you expand a little bit on what, the Jews were speaking before then. What were the um, leaders or the the, the uh, you know the, the people who ran the services doing? Was it different from the regular people? We and think it was Hebrew. To Hebrew, and what was it written in? I mean, is it Aramaic or Babylonian? Or no, what? no, no. It was written in what's called Paleo Hebrew, and then sometime about one to two hundred years before Jesus, they switched over to Aramaic. And they were they were also speaking Greek. Does that answer your question? 
So, so is, was it different between what was done in the temple versus what was done on the street and what was written? Yes, it was different. During the last couple hundred years of the temple, uh, the second temple, Greek was the lingua franca. And when did it, did it, did it turn to Hebrew at some point? No, it was Hebrew before that. You had Paleo-Hebrew beginning in the time of probably David was when they first started to write Hebrew. Well, that's way back. Yep, that's a thousand years before. Right. And then they went to Greek and then to Aramaic as the lingua franca, right? Correct. No, no. Yes and no. Depends who you, what class of people you spoke about. But basically it was Aramaic uh, about 100 to 200 years before Jesus it made the switch over. But every educated Jew at that point, in, or political Jew, in, Jeru in Jerusalem and in Babylonia spoke Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. When... What when were the Dead Sea Scrolls written and what is it written in? Uh, most of it was written in Hebrew and they think it was, they think they were written around the time of the Essenes, which have been uh, contemporaneous with and a hundred years preceding Jesus. Thank you. They were very, uh, the Essenes were a cult and right. they hid, they ran where they hid to hide from the Romans. The Romans came in roughly, uh, with Avengers around 54 or so BCE. Thank you. All right. So you understand where the uh, uh, Chia Hamei team comes in, right? Which is resurrection is from Plato's Phaedo. Hmm. Just a little technical question. Now you said that the Siddur was really um, came together under the Sadia Gaon? No, Sadia actually, yeah, you could say that. He basically put the first Siddur in modern times together. Now, I, was it not until, say, the invention of the printing press that really the common person could have a Siddur or? Uh... I don't know. That would be my guess, but I don't know. I know Sanchino printed thousands of Hebrew texts. Yeah. Major publishing company, and they still publish a lot, although they moved from uh, uh, Italy, I believe, to England. Okay. So remember, all, every, every generation has added or changed the translation of the Sidur. The Reform Synagogue says, who uh, instead of God, they refer to, it to the, the one who fashioned all. Conservatives have changed things too. Uh, I did an, uh, an article a number of years ago about the differences between the, the mid 50th, mid 50 Sidur between the Reform Movement, the Orthodox Movement, and the conservative movement with the changes in language going in. For example, we've gotten rid of some of the uh, uh, references to sacrifice that the Orthodox still have. Uh, we've changed uh, where it says we want to go back to ancient times and renew sacrifice, which the Orthodox have, and we've changed the conservative movement, and the reform movement's just left it out. If you go through the Shimona Esrei or the Tefillah or the 18 benedictions or the standing prayer, you'll find you're asking in almost every question, did I measure up today? Was I generous? Was I this? Was I that? Was I fair? It's heavy duty stuff. And it's, when you understand what's going on, it's heavy duty reading. And it's meant to be a constant reminder to improve your behavior. I guess I've bored the hell out of you guys. Nobody had any questions. <laughs> no, that was uh, fascinating, Michael. Um, does anyone have any any questions? You can unmute yourself. Michael, I'm just amazed by your depth of research and knowledge. 
I always have. Every time I talk to you, I have. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. I tried to cut it down because I, I, I didn't want, the last time I did this, it took me two hours. So I, I pushed over through a lot of stuff on it to try to shorten it. And I hope it didn't go so fast. Oh, you cramped a lot into this. Um, I will uh, tell everybody that um, we have been recording. And so if, if you want to review it or watch it again to see those, uh, those critical points and, uh, and get some of the references, uh, it will be uh, up on the FJMC. Um, there'll be a link to it on the fjmc.org slash webinars website, <laughs> right, uh, right, Alan? Yes, that's correct. And I'll and it'll be put online the recording in a YouTube, and there'll be a, a, a link there on the FJMC uh, site, and I'll put it on the seaboardfjmc.org homepage as well. The uh, link to the to the video. I have been having computer service since Sunday, and I couldn't revise this chart the way I wanted to. There are some mistakes on. Hopefully it'll be revised in the next week or so and my service gets alleviated. Well, if you want to send me that, I will uh, put the link to it on the F on the Seaboard site as well. Thank you. So, um, and uh, okay, if we have no more questions. I have a question. Yeah. Very generally speaking, Mike, I'm not asking for specifics so you know, this pair or that pair, but generally speaking, when were most of our prayers that are not necessarily the translations, but the prayers themselves, which we find in our currents of your, when were they written? Mostly. Again, I'm not asking. According, according to Pirkei it was by the men of the Great Assembly, which would have been from roughly 500 BCE down to roughly 70. However, I believe they just had the rudiments of the prayers. From what I've read, I believe they only have the rudiments of the prayers the beginnings and the endings, and that the insides were sort of fixed by Raman Gamaliel between 150 and 200 CE. Raman Gamaliel II, it was Raman Gamaliel the first. This is the second. CE? Yes. Were these written in response to uh, a growing, uh, what we didn't call it at that time, but what, what later then became Christianity? No, I think they preceded Christianity, and from what we could tell, a bunch of them were picked up by early Christianity. They don't have documents running around. You have basically two guys who were Roman Jews who tell us what the history happened, and they had access to the grind. One of them was Josephus, and I just lost the other one. It's just... They weren't objective reporters the way we would consider it to be today objective or absolutely uh, uh, accurate historians. This is Stuart Cross. I have a question. Um, I just thought about this. It sounds like there was a period of time when prayers done by uh, lay leaders were done at the same time as sacrifices occurred in the temple. Yes. How did that work? How did they relate to each other? Okay. During the, during the first temple, we don't know what happened. We have guys writing in the Talmud thousand plus years later what happened, but we don't really know. And to try to figure it out, you look at the Jerusalem Talmud, and they're not always such great reports of what happened then either, although they tend to want to protect their own turf. Uh, most of this stuff tend to develop in uh, Israel in terms of how the prayer started. Okay. You know how you thought there was only sacrifice in one place in, in uh, Jerusalem when they had the first temple? It wasn't. They had it in three separate temples, plus they had it in the high places. Are you familiar with the uh, Qumran scrolls or anything about it? No. Uh, there's a uh, you ever heard of the Elephantine Papyri? Maybe. <laughs> That's easy. The Elephantine is a river, is, is the, in the middle of the Nile River at the end, which is the farthest interior land where it's the strongest. 
was an island, and it was called uh, uh, Elephantine. And there was a Jewish fortress there in roughly 600 BCE. We believe it was under the reign of Josiah, but we're not sure. We found archeological evidence that they did sacrifices there. Then when you read in our other literature, in the Psalms and in some of our other literature, which you have about the high places, they were places they sacrificed animals and executed prayer. If you look at the Torah, there are only four prayers in it that we would consider prayers. Not, the, not, not in the beam and not in the uh, 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 Ketuvian. But the, four, uh, the one prayer which everybody knows is when Moses is praying for his sister, he says, El na refuala, God, please heal her. They're very short, they're very pithy, and that's about the end of it. They're not flowery. Not necessarily what we would consider prayer today. Did I respond to the question? I'm not sure I did. Well, it was just how did they, how did prayer interact with the sacrifices? How was that? How were During they? During the first temple, we don't one? know. During the first temple, we don't know. During the second temple, we think we know. You know the prayer, Borahu, come, let us praise God. Okay. Yeah. Imagine the te- the imagine the temple, the second temple. We don't know if it's happened in the first temple or not. There's a big courtyard, right? And the Levi'im, who didn't exist during most of the days of the first temple, but then the second temple, would run around the ramparts going, Borahu, come let us praise God. There's, there's some reason to believe that what they were doing when they said, Borahu, let's get together and praise God, that they were calling their individual groups together to form a minion in the courtyard, have their separate prayer. And that would have occurring while they had sacrifice going on. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, sim- similar to uh, the call, you know, the, the Muslim call to prayer. Absolutely, they got it from us, guys. <laughs> Among other things. Okay. I, I have a I have a question, which um, may be a little off subject, but w- when we talk about the Jewish Jewish years, uh, uh, the Right now we're we're almost at year six thousand, yeah, and and yet it was three thousand years ago that the first Jewish kingdom was established. Um, is is the Torah the reason we have the? I guess we're we're now in fifty eight. Is the Torah where the where the 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 Jewish years come from? Year zero. Year, year zero was. Uh, 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 Adam. And if you add up all the years of all the people that they mentioned in the Torah, they'll end up with today's date. When it came to counting years and celestial bodies, I don't think we were that great. Have you ever heard the way we figure the hours in a day? To know when to daven and do other things? I don't know. Nope. Of the if I lose you, read it. But here's roughly how it went. A day had to have 24 hours. And it had to be 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. There's only one way to do that. Some of your hours had to be shorter in minutes and some had to be longer, depending on the season, right? So they used to put sticks out in the courtyard of the temple and they would measure the shadows to figure out whether, whether an hour had 48 minutes or 72 minutes wasn't a great system, but that's what they did. And if you ever want to bust your teeth, read it in the English. If you really want to bust your teeth, try it in the original Aramaic. It's horrible. It's just awful. On a scale of zero to 10, it's about 100 and being awful. That's, and what I just said to you is not right, but it's close. Uh, 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 very very thank you. Is there anything else? Well, I'm Michael. Do you mind if I put your email in case anybody has wants to follow up? No, with of course. Any questions. The, the the one thing one thing I'll mention is there is there is one one chat question which maybe you were going to answer through the website posting, but the, there's a question that just says, "Is there a book you can recommend?" Yes.
the Talmud on Earth by Silverstein, and I forgot the other guy. It's in the early 2000s that it was written. The Bible on Earth, uh, which has to do a lot with the uh, uh, Exodus. There are two other books. It was How Jews Pray. It's from an Orthodox perspective, but it's not bad. And that's by uh, Adin Steinzaltz. You know, who's translated the Talmud. And there's another one which I like, which is my People's Prayer Book. It's an eighth volume book. It's really pretty terrific. None of these guys put together what I do in terms of the history of development of publishing. I find that, I find that whole thing fascinating. What was the first one you mentioned? The Bible Unearthed, is that yes. right? By Silverman? I th uh, Silverstein, I think. Well, I have one by Silverman and Finkelstein. That's it. That's the one I want. There's another one by a guy called Friedman. But I think the uh, Finkelstein book is better. Okay, I'm going to put the... Amazon link in here. And I like my people's prayer book. It's an eight volume set. Uh, some of what's in there is Dibre Mabachach. Most of it's pretty good. There's another book by a, uh, a professor of Chazanut at uh, Yeshiva University that outlines the sources of all of our, each of our prayers in the, in the liturgy. I just forgot his name. Uh, if I can find it quickly, I'll give it to you tonight. Isn't that Elbogen? Beg your pardon? Elbogen? No, Elbogen is a German scholar who, pre who followed, uh, was contemporary with and followed uh, Gratz for the history of the Jews, and he did the history of uh, liturgy. A lot of his stuff is very good but it's really breaking your teeth when you read it. Right. There's been a lot of research done since he did his work. For example, Neil Gilman at the seminary wrote about the death of dying. He did a brilliant analytical job of relating the Jewish notion of, uh, of death, uh, you know, the resurrection, back to what we learned in uh, 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 the Phaedo. Okay, any more questions? It's been very interesting. Uh, I always learn, I learned a lot tonight and uh, you know, hopefully we'll continue to learn from, uh, from Michael over the, over the years. Uh, and um, I thank you all for coming. Uh, there's no more questions, so I'll say good night and thank you very much, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you all for being patient and polite. Thanks, Mark. And uh, be well, guys. Thanks, Bob. Post the video. Great, Alan. Thanks, and thanks to all the regional guys and other guys for coming. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.